believe this is the last uh, contribution of the afternoon, but not the least. Uh, this is, comes to us from uh, West Virginia University, uh, A. Chada, C. D. Steinstring, A. Stiller, and Daddy, Daddy Berger. Uh, Professor Daddy Berger will make a presentation. It's ferric sulfide based catalyst for the model reactions of direct coal liquefaction. Uh, thank you. I'm missing the microphone. If you haven't started the stopwatch, I'll wait. If you started the stopwatch, I'll continue. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, I uh, thank you all for waiting until this time. And, uh, Jay Chala is the uh, graduate student who uh, uh, who started uh, this as his, uh, as his master's uh, project. Uh, Charter Steinspring has been working with him on the surface science. Uh, Al Stiller has been working with us uh, with the uh, ferric sulfide based catalysts. Uh, and of course, uh, since everybody else does the work, I get to come to Tokyo to talk about it. Uh, in a sense, uh, this talk is continuing the thrust of the last talk in that we're talking about uh, novel catalysts, catalysts that perhaps uh, we're still trying to characterize, we're still trying to understand, and we're using it in a, in, a, in, a, in a reaction where we really don't understand what's going on. Uh, I should set you at ease, I will not be talking about the coal liquefaction reactions. Uh, before I, I get out of the slide, and in case I don't finish, I would like to acknowledge the U.S. Department of Energy uh, for their help, and John Lee Young, uh, Dr. Stansberry, and Sharma who did some of the uh, liquefaction analysis. Uh, in terms of an outline, I would like to start with a little work on why we're interested in the ferric catalysts for direct coal liquefaction. And then I will move to model reactions uh, and characterizations of the model reactions, uh, try to explain some of the rationale for picking these reactions, some of the techniques we use for the characterizations. And then in terms of the results, we will be talking about the activity for the model reactions. We will not talk about selectivity. We talk about the analyses of the surface and the analyses of the bulk of these catalysts. We do these before the reaction, we do these also after the reaction. We try to put all of these results together to have a model which tries to take into account the chemistry that we observe, the transport processes involved. We won't have a chance to talk about the morphology, but in many uh, uh, respects, the morphology is, is, is uh, behavior is similar to that uh, talked about by Dr. Date earlier today. And then we talk about some conclusions. Uh, the question to be asked is why are we interested in coal liquefaction, of course, and why are we interested in the ferric-based catalysts? Basically, when we talk about direct coal liquefaction, what we're interested in is converting coal to products of lower molecular weight, products with a higher ratio of hydrogen to carbon, and we would like the products to be liquids. Uh, it's not essential in the so-called first stage that they be free-flowing liquids, this is usually done in an operating stage to get the right uh, kind, of, uh, kind of behavior. But they are certainly liquids at, at the high temperatures. The catalyst role in first stage direct coal liquefaction is, is multifold. First, uh, it helps to transfer hydrogen from a gas phase to the coal. It can also do this by shuttling hydrogen from a hydrogen donor liquid or a solvent to the coal. Again, remember we want to increase the hydrogen to carbon ratio. And the catalyst can also help to crack the carbon to carbon bonds. We shall see that we really don't get a lot of cracking. What we do get, though, is hydrocracking. So it hydrocracks carbon to carbon bonds. Uh, the reason many people are interested in iron as a first stage a catalyst for liquefaction is, of course, that it is cheap. And so it can be used as a non-recoverable catalyst. If it is not to be recovered, uh, it must also be environmentally benign. And typically, 
uh, the iron material that's used is used as an oxide, either like an oxy, like a ferric hydride, uh, or uh, as a sulfated uh, iron oxide, which was developed by uh, researchers in Japan. Uh, doesn't matter which you start out with, which oxide, uh, what sulfide, under reaction conditions, it's believed uh, that a primary uh, material that's formed is a non-stoichiometric sulfide or a series of these, uh, these are called pyrotypes with a value x, which is the ratio of sulfur to iron, a value x around 1. Our contribution to this is to start with a ferric sulfide. And the reason many people don't know about ferric sulfide is that it's a solid which is basically unstable at uh, even at room temperature. There it, it undergoes a solid state disproportionation to an FES2, which is the pyrite, which we call Ty, and then a series of these spiritides, FESX, and then if there is a sulfur balance, we also get elemental sulfur. And then there can be interactions between the pyrotite and the pyrite, depending upon where the hydrogen is present, uh, you can get sulfur or H2S. What is observed is that when we start with the ferric sulfide, what we get then is uh, a mixture, a close, intimate mixture of pyrite and pyrotite. And that mixture, or the ratio of pyrite and pyrotite, is a function of the temperature of disproportionation, function of the time of disproportionation, a function of the material we use in the gas phase. And so by controlling this intimate mixture, by controlling the conditions of disproportionation, we can control, we think, we can control the behavior of the catalyst. We would like the catalyst to be present to small particles. We won't be talking about the smallest particle catalysts we have made, but we can make small particle catalysts of the order of nanometers in an aerosol reactor. We can also do this by making them in situ and impregnating them in situ with the cold. We can also do this most recently by using reverse micelle techniques. But uh, basically, we will be talking about our earlier generation catalysts, which were made by simple uh, hydrothermal disproportionation of the ferric sulfide. So our objectives for this work is to characterize the activity, not the selectivity, of the ferric sulfide-based catalysts. We will use model reactions rather than the full-scale coal liquefaction because we really don't understand what goes on in the coal liquefaction. The model reaction we used are those that we expect are useful during direct coal liquefaction. That is to say, hydrogenation, we use phenanthrene, which is a typical uh, multi, uh, condensed multi-ring compound, hydrogenate with hydrogen in the gas phase, to form a number of species. We can talk about selectivity, but we won't here. Basically, what we're interested in is the loss of phenanthrene to form all of these products. So this is hydrogen in the gas phase. We're also interested in the so-called liquid phase hydrogen shuttling, which takes place in the absence of hydrogen, where we have uh, not only the, the phenanthrene as before, and also the tetralin, and there is shuttling of hydrogen between the tetralin, which is a hydrogen donor, uh, to the phenanthrene, and this molecule, of course, should be naphthalene with the two circles. Uh, and, and then you get uh, various different kinds of compounds. So again, we're interested in the reaction, in the conversion of the phenanthrene to this variety of products. We also have looked at hydrocracking reactions uh, using diphenylmethane and formed simple products. We first looked at the cracking reactions, so we used a very simple uh, aromatic cumene to go from the benzene and propylene. As we shall see, we observed no cracking of the cumene under the conditions of the, uh, of the process, so we went to hydrocracking. The materials, the, the parameters that we vary are the ratio of pyrotite to pyrite initially formed. Uh, we do this by varying the time, uh, by varying the temperature in the gas phase. Uh, what we have found is typically for direct coal liquefaction, a good catalyst appears to be one where the pyrotite to pyrite ratio is around one, so we will use that catalyst. We also look at the difference between fresh and aged material. 
uh, we look at, when I say aged, I don't mean deactivated in the reactor. Basically, we had some material that we had made some time ago, we had sealed and put into a cold room. Uh, but even so, uh, there was surface layers of oxide present. Uh, we look at that behavior relative to the fresh behavior, which was made by specifically excluded air. So we use, uh, as I said, two kinds of catalysts have two ratios of pyrotite to pyrite. This one is around 1, this one is around 10. Uh, the difference is in the temperature of this proportionation, 200 degrees here, 375 degrees here. Uh, we have also to change the, uh, get the gas phase, otherwise we have problems in the preparation. Here we had to use hydrogen, here we were able to use nitrogen in the gas phase. So we make each of these fresh. We also had some samples that were made some time ago, and these are our aged catalysts. What we measure, first of all, the conversion of the reactions we talked about. We look at the pyrotite to pyrite ratio, both before reaction, which we have here, and after reaction. I should point out that we measure the pyrotite to pyrite ratio by selective dissolution uh, in, in, in different acids. We look at the ratio of the, of the uh, sulfur to iron present on the surface, and what we do is we have a technique to eliminate the elemental sulfur. We know that it eliminates the elemental sulfur from the surface. We don't think it removes all of the elemental sulfur. So when we measure the sulfur to iron ratio in the bulb, typically we're getting the sulfur to iron ratio of, of, uh, without removing the, el the elemental sulfur. We do this again before reaction and after reaction. The surface ratio is measured by A. OJ. The bulk ratio is measured by, uh, uh, by, by EDAX. And then we won't talk about the surface morphology. We've measured that. We've looked at that with SCM. The activity for some of the reactions, for, for the reactions here, uh, the reactions were all carried out in a batch reactor using similar techniques to what we use for our direct coal liquefaction. We have four grams of the reactant. We used a larger amount of catalyst than we normally use because we weren't sure exactly how this would work. We wanted to make sure we got significant conversions, carry out the reaction to 400 degrees, 1,000 pounds of hydrogen pressure at room temperature, 400 degrees, this works out to about 2,000 pounds. Uh, if we use a hydrogen atmosphere, then we use hydrogen, otherwise we use helium. The reaction was carried out, as I said, in the batch phase for 30 minutes. And I'll try to use this uh, color code uh, consistently. The red will be hydrogenation, the blue will be the hydrocracking, the green will be shuttling, and in this case, the black will be uh, cracking. So this, this is the uh, conversion in the absence of a catalyst, basically negligible uh, reactions in all cases. These are the two for the hydrothermal catalyst prepared at 200 degrees. These are the uh, catalysts prepared uh, in hydrogen atmosphere at 375. Uh, in brief, we observe, first of all, no cracking activity uh, in any case. Uh, for the hydrothermal 200 degree, we see that hydrogenation is very much larger than the shuttling activity, whereas for the hydrogen atmosphere, the hydrogenation and shuttling are about the same. When we age the catalyst, typically we see that the hydrogenation decreases to some extent in both catalysts, but the shuttling uh, decreases considerably, particularly in this, uh, in this particular catalyst. And, uh, in this case, the shuttling and the hydrogenation both decrease about the, decrease about the same. Here, it's much more for the uh, for the age uh, catalysts. The bulk changes here. We're looking at the pyrotite pyrite ratio, and basically, uh, these are reactions carried out in the. Uh, See, before reaction, we have a pyrotite to pyrite ratio of 1. Here and 10 here, this is a logarithmic scale. Basically, what we observe is in all cases where hydrogen is involved, whether or not hydrogen is present in the gas phase, the pyrotite to pyrite ratio appears to increase after a reaction.
I'll skip the rest of the things that have been uh, talked about. But the summary, basically, from the effect of catalyst preparation, what we see is that as the current type to pyrite ratio increases, we weren't able to show this, the sulfur to iron ratio increases, hydrogenation decreases, shuttling increases slightly, and so we believe that hydrogenation depends on the pyrite amount, shuttling depends on the pyrotype, cracking doesn't change with the pyrotype to pyrite ratio. Uh, and so based on all of these results, what we have is a simple model as to what happens when hydrogen is present and when hydrogen is not present. Uh, different things happen in the bulk and in the surface. Uh, basically in the bulk, what you have is an interaction between the pyrite and the hydrogen to give us a pyritidic kind of form, and H2S is formed in here, and this leads to a non-uniform sulfur to ion ratio on the surface as the H2S comes out and interacts with the, uh, with the FES to give you mixtures of FES and FES2. If hydrogen is not present, basically all you have is the FES and uh, for going to a different kind of pyrotype. In summary, we've seen that catalyst preparation alters the pyrotype to pyrite ratio initially. Uh, the hydrothermal has a pyrotype to pyrite of unity, has high hydrogenation activity, hydrocracking is observed. Uh, the, uh, hydro, uh, the, the, hydro, uh, the hydrogen atmosphere has a high pyrotype to pyrite ratio. Hydrogenation and shuttling are about equal. Aging reduces hydrogenation and shuttling. Shuttling more than hydrogenation here, both are reduced similarly. Reactions change the bulk and the surface properties. In any case where hydrogen is present, the bulk pyrotype to pyrite ratio increases. The bulk sulfur to ion ratio uh, decreases. The surface sulfur to ion ratio are severely non-uniform. I was not able to show this. For all catalysts, all reactions without hydrogen, the pyrotype to pyrite ratio in the bulk stays the same, but the surface sulfur to ion ratio increases, as opposed to what we have in the presence of hydrogen. The surface is uniform in the presence of hydrogen. The surface is non-uniform. And so these conditions are all consistent with the model that I briefly explained. I thank you for your attention and perseverance. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Just have one question, short question, but no more than three parts. This is one. I just want to know what size you use for the ferrite and 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 ferrite. Five size. The the particle size that we have here, when we start out, they're almost like a gel, the uh, pyrotype and pi vibration, and then they're, then they're well mixed. We have basically under reaction conditions, the particle size that we have are in the, I would say, sub-millimeter region, okay, but they are porous. After reaction, I was not able to show this, there is an increase in the particle size, there is an agglomeration of these particles. Okay. And in that case, uh, after hydrogen, uh, the
of the catalyst for light alkanes conversion in the presence of oxygen and activation of methane. That's the way.